On January 11th of 2020, perhaps the most significant doll collection in history, that of renowned philanthropist and social recluse, Hugh Clark was sold at auction by Thuriaults of Annapolis, Maryland. Antique doll enthusiasts spanning the globe traveled to the Ritz-Carlton, Santa Barbara, to watch the auction live, and thousands more joined the auction live online. There really is no figure in the history of doll collecting that has such a deep historical connection to America than Hugh Gat Clark. Hugh Gat Clark was born in Paris in 1906 to the American copper magnate and former Montana Senator William A. Clark. Her passion for dolls was kindled in her early Parisian life, and over the decades, though she amassed an immense collection, the objects obtained from the historic Parisian toy store of Onam Bleu remained her favorites. Had history and world events not intervened, Huguet might have spent most of her childhood in France. The advent of the Great War, however, forced the family Toritum to America. After some time in Connecticut, Huguet spent the majority of her remaining 60 years living in New York City. The passage of the decades did not diminish her passion for dolls and their accessories, and she was often photographed throughout the years with a doll on her lap. Think of it, Huguet was raised among the finest things that anyone could own, antiquities, European art, um, Stradivarius violins, she owned seven at one point, seven, the finest ones that aren't in the British Museum were in Huguette Clark's apartments. Paintings by Monet, Manet, Renoir, Cezanne, Van Gogh, on and on. Um, the 23 acres on, on the Pacific Ocean in Santa Barbara were the best view you could enjoy. And she was raised with all of those advantages and what she was most passionate about uh, was music, imagination, stories, and her dolls. So, when a collection assembled over a lifetime needed to be sold in one day, Theriot's was the obvious choice, and that day was January 11, 2020 in Santa Barbara, just miles from her childhood home, Bellasquardo. As the auction approached, Theriot's skilled team, featuring a dozen artisans and craftspeople, spent eight hours assembling, primping, and displaying the over 400-piece collection, turning the grand ballroom of the Ritz-Carlton into a temporary museum commemorating this American philanthropist's greatest treasure. Thurialt was even able to arrange a tour of her childhood home, the famed Bellasquardo estate. After their morning coffee, these lucky doll and history enthusiasts who obtained tickets before they were sold out enjoyed a private tour of the Clark's lavish California mansion. Italian for beautiful view. The palatial Bellasquardo estate, which hovers majestically over the Pacific Ocean, has been meticulously maintained and preserved over the decades at Huguette's direction by the Bellasquardo Foundation a tribute to her mother who she loved so dearly. It's a remarkable home because you look at the photographs from the 1940s of the library, the dining room, the reception room, and they look just like that today. There, there are not many places you can go that are a time capsule uh, from uh, uh, most of a century ago. So that's really unique. The, the story, the, pro, the property is amazing. Uh, the home is wonderful, but the, the story is uh, you, when you're out in the carriage house and the, the 1933 
Cadillac 7 passenger limousine and the 1933 Chrysler convertible are still sitting there with license plates that say 1949. Uh, you won't find that many places. Uh, but so it was a very strange experience to find myself back at Bellis Guardo helping with Stuart to lead tours of the home. Uh, uh, it won't be too long before the home is open to the public and uh, everyone will be able to sign up, buy a ticket, go in on a certain date and time and tour uh, the, the music room, you got painting studio, the dining room, and three of the rooms in this home in Santa Barbara, Bella Guardo, three of the rooms came from the old Clark uh, uh, Fifth Avenue mansion in New York City. Which, which lived until 1927 and was torn down. But the rooms were taken out to a dealer and ended up in this home in Santa Barbara. So rooms that began in, in uh, Europe from the 17th or 1800s end up in New York City in 1910 to 1927. And then starting in the 1930s, they're in Santa Barbara and hidden away for 60 years when the home was not open and now people will have a chance to go through and tour that amazing cottage of the Clarks. Meanwhile, back at the Ritz-Carlton, the display room was complete. From the finest antique French bisque to the artisan cloth dolls of Edith von Arps, from specially commissioned Japanese dolls to elaborate miniatures and dollhouses for their display, Hugat's interests were nearly as diverse as her collection was grand. She was even known to have specially commissioned doll costumes and accessories from the famed designers like Christian Dior and Cartier. It's really fascinating to watch what has developed in the doll collecting world as it relates to Hugat Clark. I think perhaps more than any other segment or group of people who have read Bill Dedman's book Empty Mansions or learned about her history um, adore and love you get more than doll collectors. They feel sort of this affinity, they feel a relationship with her that's kind of understood and I, I, think, I think it has a relationship to a couple different areas within her life. Um, first of all, this is a woman who could have anything. She had Cartier jewels. She had uh, Renoirs hanging in her penthouse on Fifth Avenue. She had Stradivarius violins. She had it all. Yet, the thing that extended for the longest period of time in her life as far as a passion and a hobby and a love were dolls. All the way from when she was a three-year-old girl living in Paris uh, and, and shopping at Onam Blue for the latest in doll releases all the way to the end of her life. Dolls filled this, uh, her apartments, her rooms, and her love and passion. And so it, for doll collectors, they see that and she's like a hero. Here was a woman who could have anything, everything, but dolls were the thing that she loved the most. Seeing the collection, I think, reinforces this idea, first of all, that dolls are, are art, that, that, that uh, they're not just playthings, they are uh, memories of childhood and playthings, but it, it really reinforces how uh, artistic, maybe you could call them a decorative art, uh, but uh, some of these clearly are in the fine art category. And, uh, I think seeing it brings to life. It's, it's hard to, uh, we saw correspondence. We saw her correspondence with an artist who's tracking down just the right characters in the Japanese language to use to describe uh, a woman in Yuget's painting. Well, here we're seeing the doll that Yuget was painting. And you compare the doll and then the life-size eight-foot-tall painting, which hangs in her home here in California, with the intricate costume and embroidery and the snowy scene uh, and you see how uh, you get combined she took that little doll and built a world around it and so it, it's partly by contrast you, it, for me it partly brought her paintings and artistry to life to see the dolls that was one effect um, and then 
It's one thing to hear about them, read about them, uh, to see them. Uh, you can see how captivated the collectors are. I mean, they, they know all these styles of dolls, the jumeaux that she loved, and you can, you can hear them say, she had a very fine eye. Um, look how each one is, is somewhat unique. Look, look at, at, at what a fine example it is that she chose here and these costumes. Everybody's wowed by the fabrics, not just the ones that came with the dolls, but the ones that you get commissioned uh, from Jean Patou or from uh, Christian Dior, uh, commissioning doll clothes. And of course, they valued her as a customer who'd buy clothes for herself. Uh, she valued them as the provider of these fine fashions for her, for her dolls.